In this video, we're gonna look at the nerves of the back and the lower limbs. And then in the next video, we will look at the arteries and veins, the blood supply to the back and the lower limbs. We're gonna go way back and we're gonna look at the extrinsic back muscles and the nerves that innervate them. The extrinsic back muscles are the more superficial muscles that include the latissimus dorsi, the levator scapula, the rhomboid major and minor, as well as the serratus posterior superior and serratus posterior inferior. When I talk about the innervation of these muscles, I'm going to be talking about the anterior rami or the uh, posterior rami of these nerves. So I want to go back to where we first started and look at what I mean by anterior rami and posterior rami. So I've made a drawing of the spinal cord. This is the spinal cord and we're looking at the back side or the posterior side of the spinal cord. Coming off of the posterior side of the spinal cord are the dorsal roots. The dorsal roots contain only sensory neurons. So they're carrying information into the spinal cord. Then coming off of the anterior spinal cord, we have the ventral roots and the ventral roots carry motor neurons only. So they're carrying out these motor commands to skeletal muscles. The ventral roots and the dorsal roots meet together to form the spinal nerve. The spinal nerve is very, very short, and we find that in the intervertebral foramen. The spinal nerves contain both the motor neurons from the ventral roots and the sensory neurons from the dorsal roots. So we say that these spinal nerves are mixed because they're carrying both types of fibers. Those fibers are gonna join and mingle together, and then the spinal nerve, as soon as it exits the intervertebral foramen, will split or divide into different branches. The only two branches that I'm gonna talk about right now are the anterior ramus and the posterior ramus. So this is how we're going to um, distinguish uh, between ventral dorsal and anterior posterior. We will call the roots ventral and dorsal. We'll call the rami anterior and posterior. So we have these anterior rami and they are going to join other rami to form nerves that we name. So this is just one level of the spinal cord. So if we said that this was C6, then the anterior rami of C6 will join the anterior rami of C7 and as well as C8, and then those anterior rami become the thoracodorsal nerve. The thoracodorsal nerve innervates the muscle that we know as the latissimus dorsi. So you do need to know that the latissimus dorsi is innervated by the thoracodorsal nerve and that the thoracodorsal nerve is made up of the anterior rami of C6, C7, and C8. The levator scapulae are innervated by the dorsal scapular nerve and the anterior rami of C3 to C4. The anterior ramus of C5 is the dorsal scapular nerve. So we have the dorsal scapular nerve and the anterior rami of C3 and 4 that innervate the levator scapulae. So in, in all, C3, 4, and 5 innervate levator scapulae, but we're going to just know that as the dorsal scapular nerve and the anterior rami of C3 and 4. Then we have the rhomboids, and the rhomboids are innervated by the dorsal scapular nerve. And like we said before, the anterior ramus of C5 is called the dorsal scapular nerve. This diagram is showing the location of the thoracodorsal nerve. The thoracodorsal nerve actually comes from the brachial plexus. So the brachial plexus is a plexus of anterior rami that uh, comes from C5, 
to T1. So it's a whole plexus of nerves. And one of the minor nerves that comes off of that plexus is the thoracodorsal nerve. So we're seeing it right here on the picture. We can see that it's um, the most posterior of all of these nerves of the um, brachial plexus. So what we have to know is that the thoracodorsal nerve comes from the anterior rami of C6 to C8. That's what the thoracodorsal nerve is made of. And we know that it innervates the latissimus dorsi muscle. We haven't really talked about the brachial plexus and we talk about that in depth when we go over the upper limb, but I'm just gonna briefly tell you about the brachial plexus. It originates from the anterior rami of C5 to T1. So it's a mixing of all those uh, sensory and motor neurons and they come together and they form trunks. There's three trunks and then they separate into six divisions and then they come back together again to form cords. And then at the end of that, we have these sensory and motor neurons that um, leave those cords to form five major branches, which we call peripheral nerves. And those major branches are the axillary, the radial, the musculocutaneous, the ulnar, and the median nerve. And like I said, those innervate all of the muscles of the upper limb, so we're not getting into that too deeply here. Um, but there are the smaller nerves, like that thoracodorsal nerve that also comes off of the brachial plexus, and we said that came from C6 to C8 anterior rami to form that thoracodorsal nerve. This picture is highlighting in pink all of the nerves of the brachial plexus. And again, if we were to just widen that out, this nerve right here, that's the thoracodorsal nerve that is the most posterior, and it runs along side by side with this long thoracic nerve that we'll talk about later uh, when we talk about the um, thoracic cavity. When we look at the serratus posterior superior and the serratus posterior inferior, we are going to be a little less specific on what levels of anterior rami innervate those muscles. Uh, we'll say that the serratus posterior superior is innervated by the anterior rami of the upper thoracic nerves, and we'll say that the serratus posterior inferior is innervated by the anterior rami of the lower thoracic nerves. This picture here is just showing all of the anterior rami of the thoracic spine. Next, we're gonna look at the intrinsic back muscles, which are those deep back muscles. And this is a little more simple because all of those deep back muscles are innervated by the posterior rami. And we're not going to number those posterior rami, we're not going to name those posterior rami. The only um, posterior rami that you needed to know was the C1, um, the posterior rami from C1, which was the suboccipital nerve. But the intrinsic back muscles were divided into a superficial intrinsic level, an intermediate intrinsic level, a deep intrinsic level, and then a minor deep. So Collectively, we know that they're um, innervated by posterior rami, and now we're just going to say a general location of where those posterior rami come out because all the levels of the spinal cord have posterior rami. All spinal nerves have posterior rami, and we're not going to number them, but we're going to know a general location of where they are. We'll first look at the superficial intrinsic muscles, which are the splenius muscles, the splenius capitis, and the splenius cervicis. And they are, they are innervated by the posterior rami of the middle cervical nerves. And this picture here just shows uh, the, here in purple, the purple arrow is showing the, um, that's the spinal nerve, and then that's dividing into that posterior rami and then this green arrow here is showing the anterior rami. So the posterior rami of the middle cervical nerves. So middle cervical would be anywhere from, you know, C3 to C5 
five, that would be about middle in there, but we're not gonna be that specific. We're just gonna say the middle cervical nerves. The intermediate intrinsic muscles are the erector spinae muscles. And we also call those the sacrospinalis, but erector spinae is much more common. They are going to be innervated by posterior rami of each region. So when we talked about the erector spinae, there was the spinalis muscles, the um, longissimus muscles, and the uh, iliocostalis muscles. But they're named according to region as well. So each of the regions can be divided into three sections. The spinalis muscles are located closest to the spine, and they're divided into the spinalis capitis, the spinalis cervicis, which is also called spinalis colli, and then spinalis thoracis. The longissimus muscles are also divided into three sections called the longissimus capitis, the longissimus colli, and the longissimus thoracis. Then the iliocostalis muscles are divided into the iliocostalis colli, the iliocostalis thoracis, and the iliocostalis lumborum. And again, the colli muscles can also be called cervicis muscles. One mnemonic that's used for these erector spinae groups is I like standing because these muscles help the spine to stay erect so you can stand. And starting from the most lateral muscles, I is iliocostalis, L is longissimus, S is spinalis. So which region of posterior rami will depend on which section of the muscles are being innervated. If they're capitis or cervicis, then it will be the posterior rami of the cervical region. If it's uh, the thoracic muscles, then it will be the posterior rami of the thoracic spinal nerves. And if we're talking about the iliocostalis lumborum muscle, then we're looking at the posterior rami of the lumbar spinal nerves. Then we have the deep intrinsic back muscles, and I don't know what happened here, but our deep intrinsic back muscles got cut off. So let me just add them quick. The deep intrinsic back muscles are also called the transversospinalis muscles, and they include the semispinalis, the multifidi, and the rotators, or rotators. These are innervated by the posterior rami of each region. So the semispinalis sections include the semispinalis capitis, cervicis, and thoracis. So the semispinalis capitis and cervicis would be innervated by the posterior rami of the cervical spine, and the semispinalis thoracis would be innervated by the posterior rami of the thoracic spine. The multifidi muscles are the deepest muscle in that spinal gutter, and that space, again, that spinal gutter is between the spinous process and the transverse process in the lamina. So they're just lateral to the midline of the body. And the multifidi are present throughout the entire spine. So we have multifidi of the cervical, thoracic, and lumbar areas. And so the posterior rami of um, each area, the, the posterior rami of the cervicals, will innervate the multif multifidi in the cervical region and the multifidi in the thoracic region are innervated by the thoracic posterior rami, and the multifidi in the lumbar region is innervated by the um, posterior rami in the lumbar region. So I hope I'm not getting too repetitive, which I know that I am. So in this next one, I won't be that repetitive. So the next section that we have is called the minor deep intrinsic muscles. Those are also called segmental muscles and they are the interspinalis and the intertransversary muscles, and they are innervated by the posterior rami of each region. The one in the cervicals are innervated by the cervical posterior rami, thoracic by thoracic posterior rami, lumbar by lumbar posterior rami. So that's it for the back, and now we're gonna change gears and we're gonna look at the lower limb. The lower limb is innervated by nerves extending or coming out of the lumbar plexus and the sacral plexus. The lumbar plexus consists of the ventral rami, there we go, 
So that's anterior rami. This was a publisher's PowerPoint. So I said we were going to do dorsal ventral roots and then we we're going to do anterior posterior rami. And we're just doing this uh, just to hopefully help you understand the difference between the roots and the rami. Whereas, you know, some, like I said, some anatomists are going to call them ventral dorsal and then probably the newer anatomists are going to call them anterior posterior. Anyway, the plexuses of the body are formed by the anterior rami of specific spinal levels, of specific spinal nerves. So the lumbar plexus is made of the anterior rami of spinal nerves L1 to L4. And then the sacral plexus is, um, consists of the anterior rami from the spinal nerves L4 to S4. Usually we consider this as one plexus, so we'll call it the lumbosacral plexus because of their very close relationship. And sometimes the lumbar plexus will go down to L4 or start at T12, and sometimes the sacral plexus will go down to S5 or start at L3 uh, when it comes together to form the major nerves that extend out of those plexuses. There are four major nerves that will exit and enter the lower limb. There's the obturator nerve, the femoral nerve, the tibial nerve, and the common fibular nerve, and we also call the common fibular nerve the peroneal nerve. Here is a diagram of both the lumbar plexus and the sacral plexus and the four major nerves that comes from these plexuses. So first, uh, we have the lumbar plexus which consists of the anterior rami of L1 to L4. And from that lumbar plexus, we get the femoral nerve, and that consists of sensory and motor neurons from L2 to L4. And then the obturator nerve, which receives sensory and motor neurons from the anterior rami of L2 to L4. Then we have the sciatic nerve, which splits, as we know, into the common fibular, which is the peroneal nerve and the tibial nerve. The tibial nerve receives um, neurons from the anterior rami of L4 to S3, and the common fibular or peroneal nerve receives neurons from the L4 to S2 anterior rami. There are other nerves that come from the lumbar plexus and the sacral plexus. They're just not the four major nerves. And we've heard of these nerves as well. There is the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve. I won't ask you to memorize the levels that make up the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve, but you do need to know that it comes from the lumbar plexus, which is the L1 to L4 anterior rami. Other branches from the lumbar plexus we'll look at when we're looking at the abdominal pelvic region, like the iliohypogastric, ilioinguinal, genital femoral. Um, so we'll be, we'll be really studying those more closely when we get to the abdominal pelvic area. Then we have the sacral plexus. And again, the major nerve from the sacral plexus is the sciatic nerve, which branches into the common fibular and the tibial nerves but there's other minor nerves from that plexus as well, uh, such as the superior and inferior gluteal nerves, uh, the posterior femoral cutaneous nerve, and the pudendal nerve. And so we've heard of these uh, when we've gone through lecture. Those are just minor nerves. Again, you're not gonna have to memorize the which anterior rami make up those nerves, but you do need to know that they come from the sacral plexus and we know the sacral plexus is made up of neurons from the L4 spinal nerve all the way to the S4 spinal nerve. So the anterior rami of L4 to S4. If we look at the picture to the right here, we can see some of these minor nerves like the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve. Um, we can see the ilioinguinal, iliohypogastric, subcostal nerve, um, but then we can also see the obturator nerve, which is one of the major ones, and we see that here. And we can also see the femoral nerve uh, right here that uh, extends down 
through that inguinal ligament and into that femoral triangle where it then divides into a number of nerves. So each of these nerves then, they don't just continue uh, as only these nerves. There's also gonna be branches coming off of these nerves and they have names to them. And so sometimes we'll be naming the nerves. In the next couple of slides, we're gonna look at these major nerves and the muscles that they innervate. So this slide is showing the obturator nerve. The obturator nerve comes again from the lumbar plexus or L2 to L4. This says the lumbosacral plexus because a lot of times we do put them together, but this is that nerve right here. So here's the obturator nerve right there. And it's coming from the spinal nerves, the anterior rami of spinal nerves L2 to L4. The obturator nerve gives branches off that will innervate the obturator externus, the adductor muscles, so the adductor magnus, brevis, and longus, and the gracilis muscle. The obturator externus muscle is a uh, hip uh, rotator, and it will rotate the thigh laterally, meaning it will move that thigh um, posterior, moves that, that greater trochanter posterior. That's what um, lateral uh, rotation of the hip is, or um, another name is external rotation of the hip. Then we have the adductor muscles, the magnus, the longus, and the brevis, and they do just what the name implies. They adduct the thigh, so they move the thigh away from the midline of the body. And then we also have the gracilis muscle, and that muscle is right here, but it's been cut. Uh, and that muscle will adduct the thigh, bringing it close to midline, and also because it crosses the knee, will flex the knee. This diagram is showing the femoral nerve, and the femoral nerve also comes from the lumbar plexus, and the spinal nerves are L2 to L4, so it's the anterior rami of L2 to L4 that make up the femoral nerve. The femoral nerve is most known for innervating the hip flexors. We know the hip flexors as the psoas major, the iliacus, and the pectineus muscles. They flex the hip. And so that femoral nerve uh, innervates those muscles. It also innervates the muscles that extend the knee. So those are your quadricep muscles. It innervates the vastus lateralis, the vastus intermedius, and the vastus medialis. It also innervates the rectus femoris, which is the fourth muscle of the quadricep muscle. And that uh, muscle is in a different section here because not only does that muscle extend the knee, but it also crosses the hip joint, so it flexes the hip as well. So that's the only muscle that's going to do both, that will extend the knee and flex the hip at the same time. Then there's the sartorius muscle, and the sartorius muscle crosses the thigh in a diagonal manner and attaches to the back of the knee. And so when it contracts, it will flex the knee, uh, but it also will flex the hip. So it's the only one that flexes the knee and also will flex the hip as it contracts. So this is the only one that's sort of flexing the hip and flexing the knee, whereas all the other ones are gonna flex the hip and extend the knee. We also mentioned in class that because the sartorius is attached to the anterior side of the thigh uh, and also onto the posterior side of the thigh and it's diagonal, when it contracts, it will also cause lateral rotation. So where it inserts on the posterior tibia, it is pulling up and outward towards its origin and that will cause that hip to rotate outward, which is what we call lateral rotation or external rotation. So these are the motor functions of the femoral nerve, where they contract these muscles and they cause those muscles uh, to move the leg. Then we have the sensory portion of the femoral nerve. When we talk about the sensory function, we're talking about nerves that are called cutaneous nerves that are branches of the femoral nerve that will extend into the skin 
and then be sensitive to any type of touch or temperature or pain or sensations like that. So we call those the cutaneous nerves. The femoral nerve has anterior and lateral branches that will supply the skin to the anterior thigh and the lateral thigh. And then there's also a saphenous branch of this cutaneous nerve that will supply the medial leg and foot. So we have a, a variety of areas. We have the anterior and the lateral thigh, and then we also have a saphenous branch which supplies the medial leg and foot. So that would all be innervated by a cutaneous branch of the femoral nerve. Next, let's look at the sciatic nerve. The sciatic nerve uh, will split into the tibial nerve and the common fibular nerves. And the common fibular nerve is also called the peroneal nerve. Together, um, the, the tibial and common fibular nerves are bound together within the same sheath in the thigh. They're on the back of the thigh and they will divide, uh, it's varying in different locations. Sometimes in, in some people, they'll divide at the knee, sometimes in the middle of the thigh in the back, and sometimes all the way up by the piriformis muscle. We'll start by looking at the tibial branch of the sciatic nerve, which is called the tibial nerve. The tibial nerve originates from the sacral plexus. So we, I want you to know sacral plexus instead of lumbosacral plexus. And uh, the tibial nerve has neurons from the anterior rami of L4 to S3. The tibial nerve will innervate the muscles that extend the hip and flex the knee. And these are your quadriceps muscles. So if a muscle can affect a hip, cause movement in a hip, and cause uh, movement in the knee, that means that these muscles cross two joints. They cross the hip joint and they cross the knee joint. The quadricep muscles that do this, that both extend the hip and flex the knee, are the biceps femoris muscle, which is on the lateral aspect of the posterior thigh, and the semitendinosus and semimembranosus, which are on the medial aspect of the posterior thigh. The tibial nerve also innervates the adductor magnus. The adductor magnus is an adductor of the thigh, but uh, because of its location, that it's, you know, so it's posterior and medial, but there's a lot of fibers medial, like in the back, um, deep in the back on that femur, it can also extend the hip. The tibial nerve also uh, innervates all of the muscles of the posterior leg the superficial and the deep muscles. And so it will, uh, when those muscles contract, they plantar flex the foot. And those muscles uh, are the plantaris, the gastrocnemius, the soleus, and the tibialis posterior. The tibial nerve also innervates the popliteus muscle. The popliteus muscle um, has just one function, it flexes the knee. It just, um, it's a very short muscle that crosses that knee joint when it contracts the knee flexes. Then we also see that the tibial nerve uh, innervates the muscles that flex the toes. So the flexor digitorum longus and the flexor hallucis longus, they flex the toes and they are also innervated by that tibial nerve. An important thing to note about the tibial nerve is that it contains no cutaneous innervation. So there's no branches from the um, tibial nerve that are going to monitor the hip and thigh area. The innervation of the anterior thigh, at least the cutaneous innervation of the skin on the front of the thigh, uh, comes from the lateral cutaneous nerve of the thigh. Another name for this is the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve. And this is the uh, one of the nerves that originates from the dorsal divisions or the dorsal rami of the lumbar plexus. Then the skin on the posterior side of the thigh, as well as the popliteal fossa, and then it even extends for a variable length to the mid-calf region, 
will be monitored by the nerve, the posterior femoral cutaneous nerve. And so that's the back of the thigh, and that's the posterior femoral cutaneous nerve. The lateral femoral cutaneous nerve is a nerve that comes from the lumbar plexus. And the posterior femoral cutaneous nerve is a nerve that arises from the sacral plexus. You do need to know that the tibial nerve comes from the spinal nerves from L4 to S3. Now there's also a couple of um, branches coming off of the tibial nerve that you need to be aware of. First, we have the medial and lateral plantar nerves. And those nerves, again, they come from the tibial nerve. They will innervate the plantar muscles of the foot. Those muscles are on the bottom of the foot. And when they contract, they will flex and adduct the toes. Adducting the toes means that you're bringing all of the toes inward toward the middle of the foot. The medial and lateral plantar nerves also have cutaneous branches and they will monitor the sole of the foot. So if you step on a nail and you feel that pain in that skin area, that is going to be brought back to the tibial nerve through the medial and lateral plantar nerves. And then that information will go into the spine and then up to your brain so your brain knows what happened. Then we have the sural nerve, and the sural nerve isn't shown, but we talked about it in lecture. It's another branch of the tibial nerve. It doesn't have any motor function at all. It does have sensory function. It has branches, cutaneous nerves, that will monitor the lateral and posterior one-third of the leg and the lateral side of the foot. Next, we'll look at the fibular nerve. The common fibular nerve, otherwise known as the peroneal nerve, originates from the sacral plexus. It originates from the L4 to S2 uh, anterior rami of the sacral plexus. The common fibular nerve innervates the biceps femoris muscle, in particular the short head, but it innervates the biceps femoris. The biceps femoris is that hamstring muscle that's a little bit more laterally, and when that contracts, it extends your hip, and it also flexes the knee, so it crosses both joints. The peroneal nerve has cutaneous branches that monitor the lateral surface of the knee over that skin area. The common fibular nerve has two major branches, the deep fibular nerve and the superficial fibular nerve. The deep fibular nerve innervates the tibialis anterior as well as the fibularis tertius. These muscles on the front of the leg dorsiflex the foot. They pull the foot up. The deep fibular nerve also extends the toes and these muscles that extend the toes are the extensor digitorum longus, the extensor hallucis longus, and the extensor digitorum brevis. The deep fibular nerve also has cutaneous innervation. This branch of the uh, common fibular peroneal nerve will monitor the skin area of the great and second toes. Then we have the superficial fibular peroneal nerve that is a branch of the common fibular peroneal nerve and it innervates the muscles that plant our flex and evert the foot. So those muscles are going to be the fibularis longus and brevis. They're the ones that extend around that um, lateral malleolus and attach to the side and the bottom of the foot. And so when they contract, they're going to evert that foot and turn it out laterally. These muscles are, the, are known as the primary everters of the foot. So their main functions will be eversion and then plantar flexion of the foot. There are also cutaneous branches of the superficial fibular peroneal nerve. 
and they will monitor the skin over the anterior and lateral aspect of the leg along with the greater part of the dorsum of the foot. So I see here, this looks like a mistake to me. It's not dorsal anterior, that's a little bit uh, contradictory. It's the anterior and lateral part of the, of the leg. Other nerves of the lumbosacral plexus include the gluteal nerves, which are superior and inferior, the pudendal nerve, iliohypogastric, ilioinguinal, genitofemoral, and cutaneous femoral. The gluteal nerves include both the superior and inferior gluteal nerves. The superior gluteal nerve will innervate the gluteus medius muscle, gluteus minimus muscle, and the tensor fasciae lata, whereas the inferior gluteal nerve innervates the gluteus maximus. The pudendal nerve we mentioned in lecture two, that innervates the external anal sphincter. So we're getting uh, away from our lower limb, um, but as well as with the iliohypogastric nerve and the ilioinguinal nerve and the genitofemoral nerve, we'll be talking about those when we get to that pelvic region. And then there's the cutaneous femoral nerve. And we said that that uh, monitors the skin of the anterior and medial thigh, as well as the medial knee, leg, and foot. Last but not least, and I did not mention this in lecture, but there is a coccygeal plexus, which is made up of S5 and the coccygeal nerve, which is CO1. And together, they will innervate the muscles of the pelvic floor. So again, we're going to see this again when we get to that pelvic region when we talk about the abdominal pelvic cavity. And uh, what this um, nerve does, which this coccygeal plexus does, is it monitors the skin over the coccyx area. So that's it for this video on the nerves of the back and the lower limb.